Hi, welcome to Audiobook Academy. This is a self-paced audiobook. There's no need to keep an eye on things. Just pay attention. Thank you for taking the time to listen. This is a book summary of The Highly Sensitive Person by Elaine Aaron. The term too sensitive for their own good has been used to describe a number of children. Are you a mature adult who is able to discern subtle cues in the world around you? If so, you're probably drawn to music, art, and religion. To understand what it means to be a highly sensitive person, HSP, Elaine Aaron has written The Highly Sensitive Person. But perhaps most importantly, we learn to make the most of our HSP characteristics in order to thrive in a world where most people are not as sensitive as we are. Perhaps you've always felt overwhelmed by loud noises, bright lights, and busy days. To be an HSP, Elaine Aaron refers to someone who is highly sensitive. Elaine Aaron is a psychotherapist, novelist, and professor. The discovery that she isn't flawed, but rather endowed with an abundance of singular talents, was the result of an intensely personal journey and extensive research. Elaine Aaron, an HSP, is pleased to be a part of this small group. Aaron had to deal with her family's disarray as a child. She also found school and college to be academically easy, but she found student life to be a major challenge. With this in mind, we'll take a quick tour of what it means to be a high-functioning sensitive person, HSP, with Aaron. Aaron sheds light on our innate sensitivity and the role that early childhood attachments played in enhancing or eroding it. As a result, HSPs must be extremely deliberate in their efforts to reframe their past, rebuild their self-esteem, and recover from the inevitable wounds they suffered as children. HSPs must also learn how to be fully engaged in the world while also knowing when to step back and recharge their batteries. In an affirming way, she provides us with guidelines for managing our work as well as our social and intimate relationships. Lights, noise, smells, and clutter can easily overwhelm HSPs because we take in so much information. We're able to pick up on things that others miss, such as potential friendships, hostile feelings, musty air, and other people's moods. In addition, Aaron distinguishes HSP traits from introversion, inhibition, and shyness, giving HSPs a remarkable talent for creativity insight, and caring, all traits our society desperately needs. Non-HSPs are just as sensitive and open to nuance as those who are. According to a study published in the journal Personality and Individual Differences, girls are not more likely to be HSPs than boys. Interestingly, 15% to 20% of the population exhibits these traits in many animal species. Some members of your species should be on high alert and ready to respond to subtle cues rather than rushing headlong into new situations or dangers that may or may not arise. It is important to remember that this trait comes with unique benefits, but it also presents unique challenges when navigating a world that is largely non-HSP. This trait can be advantageous or disadvantageous depending on the situation. A self-test can help us identify this trait. As part of this assessment we are asked to rate ourselves on statements like, I am affected by the mood of others and, I feel bombarded and anxious when there is much activity around me. It is estimated that 20% of people are extremely sensitive, and 27% are moderately sensitive. These numbers are significant, but they're still too small to have a significant impact on the status quo. While most Western societies cater to the hysteria and frenzy, HSPs are often overwhelmed by these elements. Let's look at Kristen as an example of an HSP in action. Several traits are displayed in the self-assessment questionnaire by Kristen. As a college student, Kristen questioned whether or not she was insane because she felt so out of place. By the time she was in kindergarten, she was described by her mother as a grumpy baby, while teachers said she was spacey and had trouble ignoring noise. In addition, she was regarded as talented. For a number of reasons, she found college to be a daunting experience. First and foremost, she was overwhelmed by the academic demands on her time and entered into a relationship in which she fell head over heels in love. The author's insights helped Kristen, who was feeling isolated and alone. To help her understand herself and the HSP, she eventually needed someone to explain what was going on inside of her and the HSP. Kristen, an HSP, suffered from low self-esteem as a result of a stressful life experience and an overactive nervous system. Because most people don't share this trait, it's easy to dismiss HSPs as weak, timid, or withdrawn. Our sense of self-worth is shattered when we've had traumatic experiences, so we're more susceptible to feelings of vulnerability. We can unpack our past experiences and adapt to the present by learning to work with these feelings. To understand the present, 
it's necessary to look back. There is a lot of self-discovery that needs to take place in order for us to do this. We can learn a lot about ourselves by exploring our past. This includes learning about our personalities, our early relationships with caregivers, our schooling, our adolescence, and the cultural messages we were exposed to. Let's dig deeper into this. Sensitivity tends to run in families. Because we are sensitive babies, we are ready to respond in any way possible to everything that is thrown at us. Our nervous systems are constantly scanning the environment for new information. We carry these emotions with us for the rest of our lives. External stimuli can cause HSBs to become overly sensitive. Bright lights, crowded restaurants, and loud music are just a few of the things that get our adrenaline pumping. Internal cues such as pain, hunger, and memories are also very clear to us. Too little stimulation can lead to boredom, while too much can make us feel irrational and unsure of ourselves. And what one person finds relaxing may not be relaxing to another. For HSPs, what's mildly stimulating for most people can be alarmingly stimulating. For researchers, sensitivity is the ongoing subtle sensory information processing, which they believe comes from two brain systems. It's the behavioral action or approach system that's responsible for getting us to take action and being bold. The behavioral inhibition or avoidance system, on the other hand, keeps us on our toes and alert for any potential threats. In HSPs, the automatic pause to check system is a strong preference, which is particularly strong. Attachment is the point at which our innate proclivities and the circumstances of our early life come together psychologically. As a result of this attachment, there could have been two outcomes. Stressful long-term stimulation occurs when we don't learn to control our heightened sensitivity. This may have caused an increase in cortisol and a decrease in serotonin in our bodies. Our arousal system was telling us that the world was overwhelming, but our arousal was short-lived if we were soothed appropriately. The effects of attachment on us. Nature versus nurture is a phrase we've all heard before. That being said, how do you feel about how you were nurtured in your early years? If you're having trouble answering this question, think about how you felt about your caregivers when you were a child. Doing this will help us understand how we learned about the world in our early years. Arousal control was aided or hindered depending on whether it was safe or whether we were overly stimulated. When we were young children, the way we were raised has a lasting effect on us, even if we are HSPs. Only half to two-thirds of the population had a strong bond with their primary caregivers when they were infants and toddlers. To begin exploring the world and experimenting with their own independence, a child must first feel safe and secure in their attachment to a parent or caregiver. There's nothing more comforting for a child than knowing they have a caregiver who is always ready to intervene. This attachment can be insecure at times for a variety of reasons, some of which may go back to a caregiver's own childhood. Anxiety about attachment and separation can arise when a child perceives the caregiver as distracted and vulnerable. The other extreme is a caregiver who threatens or doesn't want the child to attach with him or her in the least bit. An avoidant attachment is the result of such behavior. If we don't learn from our mistakes, we won't be able to improve our parenting in the future. If we don't, we'll just keep repeating these patterns. We may overwork ourselves, take risks, and explore more than our bodies are able to handle at any given time. However, we may overprotect ourselves when we need to go out into the world and face the world. Either we're too involved in the world, or we're not. We then went to school. We ventured out into the world of busy school environments armed with our inherent characteristics and the early attachments we had formed. Adolescence, with all of its physical and hormonal shifts, was a particularly difficult part of our educational experience because of how it was broken up into stages. Learning to drive, meeting new people, and deciding on a career were all soon to follow. Some HSPs may have tried to avoid these challenges by marrying young or joining groups that offer security. During those years, if the steps seemed too big, we considered withdrawing or dropping out. Influenced by the culture around you. Chen and Rubin conducted a fascinating study comparing the characteristics of Chinese and Canadian children that are most in demand. Unlike in Canada, where shy and sensitive kids are less likely to be chosen as friends, Chinese kids are more likely to be shy and sensitive. HSPs may find themselves at a disadvantage as a result of gender differences, as well as being out of step with the rest of society. There appears to be an equal distribution between the sexes, but there are some differences. When it comes to milestones such as getting married, establishing a career, and having children, boys tend to be more introverted than girls. 
Women HSPs may be more hesitant than other people to break free of social norms and pursue their own interests until they gain the confidence to do so. Cultural stories can also help us reframe our identities. It's important to remember that for many centuries, people were divided into two classes in many cultures, the fierce warriors and kings, and the thoughtful priests and royal advisors. This division still persists today. You've probably figured out which of these directions HSPs are most likely to take. Many of us take on the thoughtful royal advisor persona in our personal and professional lives, and this is essential for the well-being of our society. There may be some unfinished business that needs to be worked out in our own minds as we grow older. HSPs benefit from reinterpreting their past. The idea here is to reparent ourselves, according to the author. When we were infants, we learned how to care for our bodies through the nurturing we received from our parents and caregivers. As a result, HSPs are advised to treat their bodies as if they were a baby. A baby does not want to be bored, but at the same time, they do not want to be overstimulated. As a result of an insecure attachment, you may either be neglecting your body or over fussy with your appearance. Additionally, we must now begin taking better care of ourselves, which our caregivers may not have been able to. It's possible that we'll shy away from new experiences in the future if they've always made us uncomfortable. Perhaps we'll need to take things one step at a time. Our fearful parts can be talked to and told that everything will be fine once they've adjusted to the new situation. We can also go home if we need to, but we should also remind ourselves that we should listen to our brave parts as well. Anxiety can be mistaken for overarousal, so it's helpful to think of our arousal as a natural reaction to the events taking place around us. HSPs benefit from transcendence, which can be achieved through meditation, contemplation, or even prayer, in addition to the more obvious forms of downtime and rest. It's a good idea to look back on our stories and reparent ourselves if we need to. A more accurate and compassionate view of our shyness and perceived failures can be gained. We can then apply these insights to our personal, professional, and personal lives. Let's take a look at a few more ideas. Relationships with other people. Shyness is often the default assumption when HSPs experience overarousal in social settings, but this isn't always the case. Shyness is often misunderstood as a sign of temporary overarousal. After overcoming the initial difficulties, you'll discover that HSPs have much to offer, including the ability to be a mysterious figure who is comfortable discussing difficult topics, as well as the ability to build trusting relationships. We can learn a lot about HSPs by following a few simple social rules. Decide whether you'd rather talk or listen when you're chatting with someone. So, what are your interests when you are not at parties? If the speaker is listening, plant the seed of a conversation by imagining a topic that you're interested in discussing. I don't like bad weather because my snakes hate it, is an example. Recall names by repeating them immediately and using them again within two minutes. And if you're required to give a speech in front of an audience, preparation is key. Be prepared by taking notes even if you're only going to ask a simple question in a public place. Relax, take a walk or adopt a strong posture, and try again if this fails. Whenever we're feeling overwhelmed, it can be helpful to think of a container, such as a safe place, idea, or person that we can call to mind. In addition, it's important to recognize the distinction between shyness and sensitivity. Shyness, on the other hand, stems more from a concern that others will disapprove of what we do. Because HSPs are so adept at detecting the thoughts of others, it's critical that we learn to control our reactions and understand that the term shy does not accurately describe who we are. As a result, it ignores the fact that we have quick arousal and are generally adept at detecting subtle social cues. Most people in the United States have no idea that arousal is not what we're looking for. This extends to our work environment, as well. Getting the most out of your job. HSPs don't enjoy long work hours or stressful and overstimulating work environments. It's not uncommon for us, as individuals, to downplay the importance of what we do, how we quietly contribute, and what we can accomplish. It's possible that we'll need to remind ourselves to be practical, not get sucked into learning or theory, or the pressure to live up to other people's perceived standards. There is a fine line between worrying about our own inadequacies and letting go of a few of our many creative impulses. Many of us choose careers in which we can use our skills and abilities to help others, but we must be aware of the possibility that these careers could exhaust us. HSPs may be leaving non-HSPs in charge of high-level government and corporate positions, which is an interesting development. Considered consequences can only be achieved through our abilities. When it comes to dating, 
HSPs may sing a different love song, preferring instead to remain single or form close friendships over romantic relationships. As HSPs, we have the ability to fall in love much more quickly and intensely than non-HSPs, so we may need to work on our self-esteem and overcome our fear of being alone in order to find the right person. It's time for us to believe that we can be loved because of our sensitivity, rather than because of our sensitivity. You and I might encourage each other to face our fears and explore our potential, or we might do exciting things together if we're dating another HSP. Because of our need for solitude, a relationship with a non-HSP might be necessary. Timeouts and reflective listening are just two of the many conflict resolution strategies at your disposal. In addition, we must be aware of the parts of ourselves that can be harsh, callous, or uncaring at times. Every therapy has its advantages and disadvantages when it comes to the tasks we must complete in each of these areas. What type of therapy may be necessary? HSPs who had a difficult childhood are more likely to suffer from anxiety and depression than those who grew up in a more peaceful environment. As a result, they'll need to work on repairing the damage done in the past. HSPs, on the other hand, possess the innate intuition necessary for success in this line of work. Interpersonal therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, physical therapy, and spiritual therapy are all viable options for those with HSP diagnoses. We can weigh the benefits and drawbacks of different medications to see which one is right for us. Because all medicines affect how our brains function on a daily basis, it's critical to be educated consumers when dealing with the challenges of being an HSP. In closing, here we go. Fortunately, both non-HSPs and HSPs are needed in the world. Especially at this moment. It's a familiar story, the warrior king versus the royal advisor. Let's take a closer look at it. Yet the times demand us, says Aaron. It's always dangerous when society's royal advisor and warrior king roles are out of balance, but it's especially dangerous when science ignores intuition and big questions are settled according to expediency rather than thoughtful consideration. In this area, your contributions are more critical than in others. That means that for those who identify as highly sensitive people, figuring out what tools they need to thrive will help them become the best version of themselves. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Please don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. See you in next audiobook.